Good, Koto. Um, well done for being here. It feels like it was a major mission in, the, in this rain. Um, and it's, uh, we're all probably a bit damp. So anyway, I'm just going to get straight into it because we've got the room booked for the usual sort of 50 minutes to an hour. And Lisa's got lots of exciting things to talk about. So for those of you who don't know Lisa, Lisa is a political theorist who teaches uh, ethics, environmental philosophy, and philosophy politics um, here across the Department of Politics and um, Philosophy. She's going to talk to us today based upon her report for the Deep South um, National Science Challenge on how should we share the risks of sea level rise. This was released um, in December 2018. And, um, and it's very exciting work to have this part of that um, challenge. So I'll pass you on to Lisa, who was a very quick introduction, but she'll be talking about her work um, during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I think so. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so I'm going to move um, very quickly through uh, the main results of this report. Um, and I'm happy to talk more in Q&A about these things, um, to communicate with you by email. And at the end, um, I have uh, the address of the report if you want to look at it um, yourself. Um, I'll be skipping uh, most of the methods, so uh, any philosophers in the room, happy to talk to you about that anytime you like. Um, so uh, we are used to thinking of natural hazards in a particular way, right? We think of natural hazards as something that is unpredictable, something that might be a one-off event, something like an earthquake. Um, but things are really different um, when it comes to climate change adaptation. We need to start thinking of natural hazards as things that are predictable, accelerating long-term threats to our collective well-being. And that means that we have to change the structures that we use to organize our relations in response to these threats. Um, so the main theme of my talk today is that it matters how we structure our relations to each other. And we can do this in an ethically robust way that reflects our settled values, or we can fail to structure our relations with each other in an ethically robust way that reflects our settled values. And we certainly want to do the former. And the new nature of this threat means that we have to adjust the structures that we use to relate to each other, that our old structures are not going to get us the ethically good results that we want. Um, that should become a lot more clear um, by the end of our 50 minutes. Um, so I am going to blow through physical fundamentals. I look around the room. Everybody that I recognize doesn't need the physical fundamentals talk. I'm going to assume um, that they are typical. There's so much good material out on the physical fundamentals um, from our own ministries, um, most recently uh, from the Department of Conservation. There's a new report on what we can expect with regard to dock um, pathways and resources with regard to sea level rise. Um, there's a really cool new um, study of the state of the New Zealand environment out from the ministry. There's good stuff from the Parliamentary Commissioner on the Environment and, of course, the IPCC. So I won't repeat any of that. I'm just going to summarize um, what the sort of ethical gist is from all of this good um, physical knowledge um, that we have and we're continuing to get more of. So ethically speaking, what matters for the way we structure our relations to each other is this. Um, sea level rise is locked in and accelerating. This is something you all already know, but if you think about its impact for ethics, um, what this means is we can't solve this problem by taking mitigation action. Um, we should take mitigation action, but the sea level rise that we're going to have to adapt to and the other climate change effects that we're going to have to adapt to are, um, at least for the medium term, locked in and accelerating. We're looking at more frequent, more in intense, weather events, coastal erosion, saltwater intrusion, um, these sorts of things m require us to adjust our relations to each other, um, regardless of how successful we are um, at uh, uh, mitigation on a global level. Um, we also need to think about the hard ethical questions that are raised by existing technical responses to these kinds of challenges. So, if you accept that everything is locked in and accelerating with regard to sea level rise, and that we're going to see increasing inundation, for example, you might think, oh, we need to think about engineering solutions like seawalls and barriers. Maybe we should restore wetlands. The whole panoply of options that we have 
from an ethical perspective, what matters about these is every single one of them has trade-offs that we need to consider. So we can't mitigate our way out of these um, needs to reorder our relations with each other, and um, we can't hope for a technological silver bullet. Um, so as I said, what really matters um, from the physical science is the fact of increasing frequency of what used to be relatively rare weather events. Um, things that were used to happening once every hundred years um, under uh, uh, the sort of likely conditions. You know, you have a, a king tide, you have low air pressure, you have unlike, unlucky storms coinciding with the wrong sorts of times of year even. And you're looking at at least every year and maybe even every tide. So ethically speaking, um, we know that we have to uh, prepare for these changes. Um, I'm not going to run through the amount of money um, uh, that is uh, sort of the value of our threatened resources, but things that we're used to having are no longer going to be available to us unless we um, take action. So we're used to having beaches, for example. We're used to having um, coastal airports. We're used to having roads. We're used to having houses um, that don't flood every year. And now we know um, that the mitigation challenge is actually even greater than it was. Um, so we learned um, last year with the uh, UN's SR15 um, that it really is important for us to keep uh, uh, the global mean temperature above pre-industrial levels to less than 1.5. And one, um, there's a sort of ironic silver lining to this fact, and that's that people are getting really serious about adaptation. Um, Greta Thunberg is speaking the truth and people are listening, and it's astonishing <laughs> and it, it, happy. Um, one thing I want you to take from thinking about Greta Thunberg, um, you know, try not to be super emotional. <laughs> think about Greta Thunberg and think she is absolutely not a defeatist, right? So uh, another message about reordering our relations is this is something that we can view as an opportunity rather than a bitter pill. Think about um, the local challenge of dealing um, with uh, adapting to climate change here in South Dunedin, right? The status quo of the housing stock in South Dunedin does not correspond to most of our ethical intuitions anyway, even without climate change, right? So we now have an opportunity to reorder our relations such that they match our ethical intuitions. Even apart from adapting to climate change, we would have had this uh, imperative in some areas, and I would say um, the status quo in South Dunedin is certainly one of those. Um, so I said I wouldn't talk about method. I'm just going to say a couple really quick things about method. Um, me and my team, uh, all of us together, uh, were able to take advantage of the method of critical dis description. I've already been using it in this talk so far. What I mean by critical description is making the implicit values in our practices explicit and seeing whether they match up with our settled ethical values. Um, and the, one of my favorite examples of this is a pretty simple one. Um, this is instantiated in many places in the world, um, especially uh, in the coastal United States. Um, the example of the following policy. What if we had a policy that said, the rich get seawalls and the poor get moved? Right? On the face of it, this sounds like a pretty appalling policy, right? I, I never meet people in New Zealand who say, yes, I endorse this. The rich get seawalls and the poor get moved. At other places, it's easier to find people who are willing to endorse it. At any rate, <laughs> right? Um, this policy follows from an on the face of it rational principle, namely that you could spend more to protect higher value property. Right? So if your spending on adaptation follows market property value, you're going to end up, without ever saying so, with a policy that expresses the value, the rich get seawalls and the poor get moved. Um, it's this sort of analysis that we're going to be doing in this talk. Um, so I want to talk about um, business as usual, and then I'm going to talk about how we can overcome business as usual. As I already said, um, what we're interested in here is interacting with each other fairly, decently, without having suboptimal outcomes that none of us anticipated. And these correspond to values of equality, agency, and collective utility. Um, these are not radical values, um, but they are called into question um, by the structures governing um, uh, aspects of climate adaptation today. So there are basically two main 
structural problems. The first has to do with risky new development. Um, I hear about this all the time. People say, you're talking about climate adaptation. I cannot believe that we're building another new retirement home in Thames, for example. Or I cannot believe that we're going to pile new waterfront development right where um, we're all going to have to end up paying for it. Um, this seems to threaten our values about fair interaction. It seems like we're put on an unequal fitting, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail later, from between society on the one hand, which is supposed to cover the costs of loss according to, uh, that's attributable to natural hazard, and uh, from the sort of privatization of, of investment gain for an individual investor. Um, so there's something wrong with our relations as they regard risky new development. At risk existing development is a whole separate set of ethical problems. There's not a single ethical problem associated with climate change adaptation. It's a really different kind of relationship we have with each other when we're talking about at risk existing development, things like our airports and our roads and our coasts and our, our uh, at endangered um, uh, socio uh, cultural communities um, like those in South Dunedin. There, um, I think the, the biggest ethical risk that we face is that people are not likely under current conditions to have a say in the policies that affect them. If you talk to people who recognize that their status quo is threatened by climate, uh, climate change, they are worried that some expert from Auckland is going to show up and tell them that they have to move. And they feel weakened and disempowered, and that also doesn't correspond with our settled ethical values. And finally, um, for both of those uh, uh, sort of structural problems associated with climate adaptation, we have the problem that if we don't coordinate our decisions, we're going to end up somewhere with that we never wanted to be. I'll talk about that um, toward the end of the talk. Okay, so I said there's lots of good stuff coming out. Um, this is uh, last month's OECD report. There are only four case studies in it. New Zealand is one of those four. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot in this uh, uh, next few minutes about the consultation process with the public on sea level rise adaptation that took place in Hawke's Bay here in New Zealand. And it's a really interesting paper. I recommend everybody check it out. Um, one of the interesting results of this report is that even though uh, we may be a model for the world uh, with our consultation processes, a model that could be improved, I'm going to argue, um, we are together with the US and Latvia as the only people without a national adaptation plan. Well, let's hope that changes soon. Okay, so um, this is the beginning of a series of slides of bad news. Um, I want to tell you right at the outset, they will be followed by a series of slides full of good news. Okay, so right now what we're going to do is describe business as usual and then um, see how we can address it. So these are a series of five glosses of the status quo, what it looks like to relate to each other under the status quo. Um, probably the most ethically non-robust is the first one. Um, the status quo means we're engaged in ongoing transfer of risk to the most vulnerable. Almost no one would endorse this policy. Who should bear the risk of some great new threat? The least vulnerable or the most vulnerable? Who's most resilient? Perhaps that person should naturally bear the burden. This is a, an intuitive uh, thing that most people can reason to ethically without any trouble at all. And yet our policies do the opposite. We're engaged right now in transferring risk to the most vulnerable. Um, this could be uh, classically future generations who are vulnerable not only with regard to the physical circumstances they're likely to inherit, but also vulnerable because they have no voice, right? And uh, it's clear right now that what we're doing is kicking the can on adaptation, um, piling up behavior that our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are going to have to pay for unless we take action. Um, there are some interesting solutions being proposed to this right now in New Zealand. One of my favorite is by Jonathan Boston and Judy Lawrence. We say we need an EQC-like institution to invest now in pre-funding adaptation so that we don't transfer the risk um, to the next generation. So it's not like this is rocket science. Right? We don't have to make life especially hard for the next generations. But under the status quo, that's what we're doing. 
um, a little subtler are the intragenerational unfairnesses. Um, and in those cases as well, we're transferring risk to the most vulnerable pretty generally. Even um, if you think of a relatively privileged group, um, like people who can afford to buy a house on the Kapiti Coast, right? Even there, we're transferring risk to the most vulnerable um, by having a status quo which reduces the amount of information available to buyers, but has relatively full of information available to sellers, um, we are picking out one group and transferring the risk to them. And incidentally, um, after uh, the, the property owners of Capity Coast won a court case uh, uh, requiring the, uh, it's a long and complicated story, but basically once we had an information and visibility circumstance in the Capity Coast, a third of the at-risk properties were transferred within a few years. Right, so the, the people are well aware that this is a transfer of risk. Okay, let's talk um, next about another gloss on business as usual. And this is what I think is a dangerous gap in the rule of law. I've talked about this already. With regard to risky new development, we are not on a fair footing, considered as a whole, relative to property investors. It's not that property investors are a bunch of evil vultures, it's that property investors playing by the rules we give them are unable to cooperate with society. And let me explain what I mean. Um, so uh, how many of you guys have ever seen a game theoretical matrix like this? I'll talk you through it briefly. Um, we don't have time to do introduction to game theory, but the beauty of game theory is that it's really simple. <laughs> I've been talking about um, our need to set ourselves on an ethically robust footing with each other. What game theory does is demonstrate that in the simplest possible way. What is your relationship to another person? Considering the choices that are available in the current structure to each of you. So all it does is formally map out your choices. Um, so you guys might have been um, contemplating every now and again, depending on your place in the, um, this particular structure, either the evils of landlords who will insufficiently insulate and charge you, you know, proactively for costs they haven't even yet experienced, right? Some of you may have considered this. Or you might be considering the irresponsibility of renters um, who trash your place and break windows and don't call you when the water's leaking. And it seems as if renters and landlords, especially here in university town Dunedin, um, are invidiously related. Is it because they're a bunch of moral criminals? No. It's that we've structured their relationship so it's impossible for them to cooperate, right? We have a system which makes it very difficult to get justice from either side, very difficult to communicate in a way that isn't, um, uh, uh, that, that doesn't defect from potential cooperation. It's that kind of dynamic like the landlord renter dynamic um, that I'm trying to talk about with regard to sea level rise. Um, so a classic game theoretical game is the game of chicken. You guys have been looking at this slide for a few minutes now, so you probably already understand chicken. Um, the important thing to know about chicken um, is that there's an option for death, right? If everybody goes for their uh, uh, individual interest, if they defect from the opportunity to cooperate, um, then everyone is going to lose. So how is sea level rise like chicken? Um, with regard to at risk, uh, sorry, with regard to risky new development, I think we are in a game of chicken as society vis-a-vis -vis all of the uh, would-be property investors. Um, so what we would really like is not to add value to the locations that are most at risk. It's good for society to have a, a collective flourishing. And if you have a value that can grow for 100 years versus a value that's going to expire in 15 or 20 years, clearly for society, it's better to add that um, uh, investment to a place where it is less at risk. Unfortunately, we don't have the structure available to make that um, decision a rational one for investors. After all, Investors, when they put money at risky new developments, can, if the investment flourishes, privatize the entire game, right? That is their game, not society's game. Uh, they won't even have to pay capital gains taxes on it, right? So uh, that's their money. Um, but they can hope 
that society will cover them for any natural hazard loss. Why do they hope? Well, New Zealand has a long tradition of solidarity with regard for, to people who suffer natural hazards. Just think about the quake outcasts in Christchurch, right? Leaving people uncompensated after they've suffered a natural hazard um, is something that is culturally very difficult to do in this country. Moreover, people who invest in risky coastal development are disproportionately advantaged and have a good reason to think that their voices are likely to be heard with any future decision making. Right? So they have good rational reasons to bet that they will end up having their losses covered while they can privatize their gains. And what this means is it's very difficult for us to engage fairly as uh, investors versus society. Now the standard solutions to chicken are negotiation um, and signaling, right? If I take my uh, steering wheel off my car before I start my game of chicken, you know I'm not gonna veer because I can no longer veer. Um, and it's our contention in this um, work that we should do something like that as a society to make it easier for property investors to cooperate. Namely, we should send credible signals that risky coastal investment is not going to be compensated. Right? So it's perfectly possible for us as society to encourage cooperation, but so far we haven't done it. Um, so uh, a couple more, I'm gonna try and make these a bit shorter. Um, I'm going to talk about hard defenses in a minute. I already talked about the ethically non-robust aspect of the rich get seawalls and the poor get moved. Um, and I talked a little bit about um, a lack of say-so in the future of your community. Um, when we have top-down consultation, like an engineer showing up and telling you the most rational thing is to move, um, what we have, rather than a possibility of cooperation, is a feeling of disempowerment. And finally, um, we are hurtling toward outcomes that nobody wants, but it's bad enough when we put ourselves in a vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis property investors. At least in that case, somebody wins. Um, in some aspects of what we're doing, we are heading toward uh, outcomes where nobody wins. And we're doing that because we're not considering the collective outcomes of our decisions. Um, we end up accidentally in places we never intended to be like still emitting excessive greenhouse gases, or continually losing our necessary wetland habitats to things like increased ski lift resort development, or um, losing access to the beach while trying to protect property rights next to it. Um, so that's the one I wanna talk about next. Um, so this is the, another very common game theoretical model of how people interact with each other. But this one is different because everybody's the same. It's not society versus a player. It's all players together. And uh, I know some of you <laughs> are really sick of this particular graph. Um, in the tragedy of the commons, uh, what we have is a, uh, something that can be sustainably used if everybody cooperates. But if even a few people or if all of us decide that we can get a little more privatized gain at everyone else's expense, we're really tempted to free ride on the distribution of cost to absolutely everybody. And what we end up with, because everyone's rational, is unsustainability. The classic instance of the tragedy of the commons, as everybody here already knows, is greenhouse gas emissions at the global scale. We want someone else to restrict their behavior, and we all want to keep emitting. We're really hoping someone else will save us. Right? This is not a mature way to interact with everyone else. It's not ethically robust. We need to grow up. Right. But uh, for this talk, what I want to talk about is um, the way that even our best consultative processes, the ones that overcome that problem of the lack of say-so in the policies that affect me, even the best case consultation mechanisms tend to fail to achieve the outcomes that all of us would have endorsed. Um, so I told you before the OECD picked out our Hawks Bay consultation process as something that should be a model for the world. And in many ways it was. Um, uh, so they spent more than a year. Um, they uh, had regular meetings with uh, local community members, asking people in a series of different communities all along Hawks Bay. Actually, for your, from your perspective, it's like this. All along Hawks Bay, what should we do in the short, medium, and long term?
with regard to uh, our need to adapt to sea level rise and increased coastal erosion and inundation. And um, with the help of experts over a series of months, um, people analyzed their collective values and they came up with locally legitimate decisions about how they wanted um, to invest in climate change adaptation. And every, every community did this individually. And um, so they had a range of options from seawalls on the one side to managed retreat on the other, and in between were things like groins and redeveloped wetlands and that sort of thing. What do you think they chose? A whole mix of things, a whole lot of retreat. Hmm? Oh, boy, that would be nice, huh? No, retreat was in the too hard box. Nobody chose retreat. So the, the, the least cost social value was never reached. Of course they all chose seawalls, right? <laughs> because the structure of the decision-making process encouraged everybody to choose seawalls. There was a little bit of variation in the short and medium term, but over the long run, everyone chose hard defenses. Just as with greenhouse gas emissions, we all want, for example, continued access to beaches in the Hawke's Bay region. We all know that building a seawall means no beach. We all want access to beaches, but we, what we hope is that our neighbors retreat and we can go to their beach while we sit behind our comfy seawall, right? So the way that the decision was structured, these people are not evil, they are rational. And within the decision-making process we offered them, everybody chose seawalls. And so what they effectively decided was to eliminate beaches from the Hawke's Bay region. And I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen. <laughs> the council's committed to considering the results of the consultation process, and right now they're making decisions about how to implement those things. It is not too late for the beaches of Hawke's Bay. Um, but it is an important thing for us to recognize that if we don't structure our consultation appropriately, even as we're respecting each other, even as we're dealing with each other fairly, if we don't consider the collective consequences of our discrete decisions, we don't have a moment where we build in ethical reflection and we're going to end up somewhere we never wanted to be. Another real downside of the Hawks Bay process was they were given at the very beginning a whole bunch of um, values to consider, a, a long list of them. One of them was endangered species and biodiversity. And every group ranked endangered species and biodiversity low um, because that wasn't their remit, right? They were considering what to do about climate change adaptation, not what to do about the extinction crisis. Now, if you ask people, did you will the extermination of all of the endangered species in the coastal areas of Hawke's Bay? Not one of them would say yes, right? But effectively, that's what they decided. It's because we structure the process wrong. It's not that they didn't care, it's that they weren't properly able to express that care. Um, so that's the end of the bad news. <laughs> Business as usual is not looking good. Uh, let me take a few minutes and talk about um, possibilities for better news. Um, so we can get beyond business as usual. Um, some of these solutions re require central government actions. Others um, uh, can be done more at the local level. In terms of central government action, obviously, we need to send credible signals, otherwise we're gonna remain prey to this trade-off between solidarity on the one hand and minimizing moral hazard, right? Uh, right now, we are not in a rational relationship with people who wanna do risky new investment. Um, regulatory certainty could end that game. Um, so that would be good. <laughs> I also think we should stop transferring risks to the future. I think it's a really good idea for us to pre-fund adaptation. Um, so, uh, Real pricing, in the world we inhabit today, real pricing is the quickest way to get behavioral change. Obviously, it would be nice if everybody had their ethical considerations and acted on them perfectly, but we're talking about human beings, and if you're interested in a quick behavior change, in my view, there's no better way to get that than putting a price tag on it. Um, so I think it would be a really good idea, since we cannot find the polluters Right? They're mostly dead, and the existing ones are offshore. Right? We're not going to get polluter pays for this. Instead, we need to do beneficiaries pay. Um, Hawks Bay, in their process, had some real advantages in that regard. For example, they built in the cost of removing eventual seawalls. 
from the total cost of um, hard defenses. So they had people recognize through cost, through the dollar value, um, that hard defenses um, had externalities and were only a temporary solution. Um, that was good, but we could do better. Um, I think it's really important for us to um, have to pay for the externalities of our decisions. So if I want to build a seawall and that transfers energy to my neighbors, I certainly owe them some kind of compensation. Um, so I think uh, uh, we have good reason to be optimistic that in this country especially, we are capable of overcoming the, the pathologies of business as usual. We already have some really nice guidelines about consultation. As I've said already, there are two big faults with it. Um, the, the one I've talked about most today is this problem of not considering the collective implications of our discrete decisions. And I think building ongoing ethical moments into our decision making such that we can deal with the outcomes of our um, possibly accidental, possibly relatively misinformed decisions, this is essential. The other thing I haven't talked about much yet and that I'll just mention really quickly is the current consultation mode amplifies the voices of the most privileged, right? So how many people under 40 are going to show up to a voluntary community meeting at noon on a Friday? Right? Almost none, right? We need to be active as a state, as local, regional, and central government. We need to be active in recruiting normally invisible people. And that includes young people and renters, as well as people who can speak for the future. In my view, um, we need to imitate, uh, uh, well, the Hawks Bay process a little bit, but uh, better some other consultative processes in places like British Columbia, um, where uh, people are offered fair compensation for their time. Um, so I've already talked about this. We need to overcome our collectively irrational outcomes. Um, so uh, the answer to today's question is there is no answer except <laughs> it's not really that wussy because this imperative to decide, that is substantive. Right? As long as we fail to make decisions, we're continually vulnerable to these bad relations we've built for each other. If we make decisions, like sending clear signaling about compensation, we will do better. Um, and in fact, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for collaborative adaptation planning. Um, so this is uh, one of my uh, colleagues at the Deep South National Science Challenge, Johanna Smith. She and her collaborators have been working um, uh, to imagine different futures for what is currently an EWE-run dairy farm, but could well evolve into something more sustainable, um, especially given the fact that they're vulnerable to coastal erosion in their location. Um, they used uh, 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 lots of different ways to get people talking about things, visualization, engagement with students, direct outreach to young people. It was much more inclusive than the standard process. Um, this I just wanted to show you uh, just how intense collaboration has to be. Right? The one and done quick consultation is, uh, in my view, worse than nothing. Uh, if you're going to do democratically legitimate consultation that gives people a say in the outcomes that affect them, it costs money and time. Um, but the benefit is to bring everybody along with you in making this world that allows us to relate to each other better rather than worse. Um, you have the Hawks Bay process rather than the gilet jaune <laughs> that, they had, that Macron built for himself with his top-down policy. Um, I'm just going to skip this and get to that. Um, so I think we have a real opportunity as a country um, to do better uh, than pretty much anybody else. But we're used to, in the sort of adaptation circles, we're used to pointing to the UK and going, they know what they're doing. They have a climate change commission. They have advisors. They're already, they've adjusted their insurability problems. Aren't they great? I don't know how many of you guys have been listening to Greta Thunberg lately. They have not been great. Right? It is time for us to step forward um, and show the world how it's done. It's not rocket science. I think we can do it. Thank you. Yeah, now we have time for questions. And I see there are a couple already. Do I hit this Q&A? Oh. Thank you, um, you guys who are not here for providing the first questions. I really appreciate that. Oh my goodness. In what ratio should we invest in adaptation mitigation for the next decade? 
Well, the, the honest first answer to that is, of course, I have no idea. I'm not an economist. But I will say um, what we should consider ethically with regard to that. Um, so conventional economic um, planning uses a formula for discounting the future. And it's based on a couple of assumptions. Right? We assume that future people will be wealthier than we are. Um, if, if you have real measures of wealth, um, such as natural capital measures, there's no chance of that being true. And even if you use conventional dollar value measures, um, I, this generation might be the first for whom that's not true. Um, so that's the first sort of underlying premise that allows us to discount the future that I think is just empirically a no-go. Um, second, uh, discounting the future presumes um, that just because people can't speak for themselves, we can neglect their interests. This is using uncertainty as a proxy for ethical robustness. And as anybody who's thought about sustainability knows, it's just not okay to use uncertainty as an excuse not to act, right? So even back in Brentland, right, the original idea of sustainability is you don't use uncertainty as an excuse not to act. Instead, you have to think about keeping your options open for an eventual good outcome, even as you're not really sure how to get there. Um, so I don't know what ratio we should use, but I sure do know that the current conventional future discounting is ethically and empirically not robust. Maybe I should take a question from here first and just alternate. Would that be okay? Um, there was one over here first and then, yeah. Yeah. So we're all going to be very busy doing nothing other than trying to make the future suitable for us to do something then. Right. Oh, that's a really great question. We actually break out of that cycle where some people have the time and not necessarily the skills. It has to be short enough for me to repeat for the recording. I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, so here's what I take from the question. If everybody has a role to play in adapting to climate change, how can we possibly live our lives reasonably because we'd have to spend 100, 200, 300 percent of our existing effort oriented toward the future, and this doesn't seem reasonable. And it most certainly it is not reasonable. Um, uh, that's a great question, right? So um, the first thing I should say with regard to that is I think the frame of current sacrifice for future sustainability is a mistaken frame. And the reason that the frame of sacrifice for future sustainability is mistaken is that it neglects the opportunity costs entailed in the status quo. Um, so take the example of automobility. And I'm so sorry for those of you who've heard me say this before. It's my favorite example. I'm going to use it again. So automobility. When I was born, I was not asked, do I endorse a robust public transport system or do I endorse automobility? Right? Nobody ever said to me, you're going to be in this social convention where for most uh, humans, uh, you have to use a personal vehicle for, fueled by fossil fuels and emitting such that you're damaging everybody for every mile just to get around and have a socially normal world. Nobody asked if I wanted to be, as I like to say, fat and estranged from everybody else. Fat, sick, and estranged from everybody else. Um, but that's what I got. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, I think if we adequately took account of the real costs of the status quo, we would see that there are co-benefits in every little step. And so rather than working for the future, we would be working for our present. Um, for example, um, there's real anger in the UK recently about um, they're not having spent their money to reduce pollution as well as CO2 emissions with regard to their transport system. Um, 700 people a year are dying who don't, don't need to die according to the Guardian story I read. Um, we should take account those current sacrifices. And by working to end that, we're making our current life better, not just the lives of the future. Um, so the second part of your question was, how could I possibly have sufficient energy to address this? And the answer is that you have to stop thinking, right? Essentially, that was it. Um, um, we need to recognize that these problems are collective action problems and the individual, <laughs> individual act. Well, <laughs> can you guys uh, fix this? Sorry. Oh, good. Um, 
thinking of yourself as an isolated consumer is just buying into the neoliberal rhetoric that is keeping us all in this unoptimal status quo. So don't do it. Right? It's important to think of yourself as a member participating in a collective. Um, show up to group meetings, do what you can. Don't pretend that you can do this all on your own. You'll just feel disempowered and you would never succeed anyway. And you'd be playing into the hands of your worst enemy. Um, and now I'll take another question from this board. Oh, there are so many. Hold this a second. Um, oh, good. There. Can climate change be seen as a tragedy of the commons? Definitely. Or is this a tragedy of capitalization? Which of these two value propositions needs to be highlighted? The, I don't know what a tragedy of capitalization is. So if Anal could explain that, then I'll respond to it. Oh. Oh, well, I mean, um, I'll give you my quick and dirty answer to that question. Uh, you probably won't like it, but here it is. So um, if SR15 is to believe uh, we had a dozen years last year, we have 11 years this year. I am not willing to wait for capitalism to end to save the planet. I think that would be a huge mistake. Um, I think that uh, we think about values, we think about policies, we think about behavior in a sort of a spectrum. And we do want better values. I don't think uh, the current economy has been operating on capitalist principles for a long time. Right? The productivity gains right now are to be made through government contracts, through uh, legal extraction of resources that are so far from any kind of fair market. You know, to talk about this as capitalism is already a mistake. However, um, if you want short-run behavior change, like the kind we need to stay under 1.5 degrees or anywhere close to it, I don't think you can do better than a price mechanism. And so I think a global carbon charge, starting regional, making a club of the willing, and expanding as far as possible is the best solution to the, the, this question, the, the um, climate change mitigation problem. Um, another hand here. So now I'm going to take a, a question from the locals. Yeah, yes, please. Do we not have to change the way we're talking? We were talking about Tom from Boston saying I'm the poor. And he talks about child poverty. Really, we're talking about the relationship. Don't we have to change that story? In other words, and we get local governments talking about funding for depreciation. What they really want is fuel and vigors for tomorrow. Yeah. Don't we have to start looking at natural capital in that equation before we get that answer? I'm going to try to repeat it. Um, but the fact is, your expertise is greater than mine. I just completely agree with you. Um, so uh, the question is, we're talking about um, financial instruments and money values and reducing poverty. But what we really mean is uh, fair access to materials, um, like resources that we need to live, and that the the limits on these are, are uh, much starker than they would be on anything that's measured in money. Um, and uh, clearly that's true, and that's why I'm optimistic about this country in particular, because we are doing this well-being budget, maybe a baby version this year. Um, but if we could uh, develop this such that the real costs and natural capitals of our decision-making were reflected in the considerations we make. If every time we made a budget decision, we had to think about the natural capital implications um, as well as the economic immediate implications measured in money, I think we would make better decisions for the future. Ones that, I mean, ones that weren't, we're all in overshoot, right? All of the developed countries are um, only able to, to live the way we do because we're stealing from the future and from the present disadvantaged. A better accounting system would make that clearer to us. Um, Next one here, the anonymous attendee says, <laughs> summarize the whole talk to one key takeaway point. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that is a tough question. I guess uh, there's, a, there's a nerdy academic one and a better one. The nerdy academic one is, I really think we need to consider the collective implications of our discrete decisions, that these it can be invisible to us what we're doing, and we have to be clear about what we're actually doing. The less nerdy one is the one I said at the end. I really do think, as a country, we have a globally unique opportunity to do better than anybody else. Yeah. I think that's the main thing. Yes. 
Yeah. And I'm really interested in hearing the consequences of the consultation and the stay in a very deep way of doing that thing. Yeah. Because we're already considering a serious consultation with our community. Yep. Um, and how to do that with the opportunity of these proactive council to adapt the policies and those who are. Mm -hmm. It really is. I'm going to summarize a bit and then you're going to correct me and tell me which bits I forgot. Um, so uh, Eleanor is talking about, did just die? Um, Eleanor is talking about the opportunity that we have in South Dunedin um, to have a really robust consultation exercise around these challenges that we face. Um, because we can interact with the community and the council in a way really better than what has happened elsewhere, including Hawks Bay. Um, I do think that um, with regard to the, the first problem of representing the underrepresented, um, Dunedin is just much more likely to succeed than they did there. And they did have compensation, but their outreach wasn't active enough. You know, we already have, um, uh, 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 thanks to the collaboration of community groups and the council, um, people whose whole job it is to make sure this goes right. Um, that's already a huge advantage over other people. Um, the other thing I think is harder. Um, so uh, including the underrepresented, that's a no-brainer that just takes will. Um, making sure, yeah, yeah, right. Totally, will and skill, I, that is true. Um, and it shouldn't be, I don't mean to downgrade it, I think it's an essential, if you, if you don't have it, you might as well not do consulting. Um, but I think it, thinking about the collective implications of these decisions is harder. Um, just because um, if you think if we divided Dunedin up into sections, we wouldn't have easy cooperation available to us unless we built that into our process. Thank you. I, I no longer have access to my screen, but um, how do we approach limiting real estate development on waterfronts? Um, I think we should make it clear that uh, the this is exactly what you can expect in terms of compensation and insurability and no more. And then in this case, I think price signals would take care of that. Um, maybe that's too optimistic. <laughs> Do we have time for one more question from the room? Yeah. In relation to the last one, some insurance companies are already saying they're not going to insure such problems. Yeah. And there's been a huge outcry in the media and parliament <coughs> saying this is all wrong, they're money grabbing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I'll try to repeat the question. So the question is, um, there's already insurance retreat in places, and there's been a lot of media scare about this, and a lot of political talk about how terrible it is that we're not being done right by global reinsurers, um, which whoever expected that? Um, but <laughs> but I mean, one thing insurance is really good at is sending a, a, a coherent signal. Um, so there's a colleague of my Deep South Challenge, Belinda Story, has done really good work on the fact that increasing people's knowledge about the risk doesn't have any effect on their behavior with regard to risky coastal development. Almost none. We're a wishful creatures. Um, but insurance retreat, that has a really powerful effect. Um, so I think you know, there's no problem with that. Um, I, I'm so grateful um, that you all showed up. And I do want to, I hope I can put up my last slide. Well, just because it has my contact information, um, well, I'm not able to, but I'm Lisa Ellis at otaga.ac.nz, and I'd love to hear um, from any of you uh, if we can keep this conversation going. Thank you. I would just quickly like to um, formally thank Lisa as well for coming today, and you all as well for coming along. Um, I've, I've found that totally Wonderful, um, but I also really like the fact that there is some optimism, and those of you, who, oh, there's only a few of my students here, but know that I am a little bit optimistic, and I really hope, um, like you do, that as human beings, we can be um, human beings and actually do something in terms of what you're talking about and create this collective um, good out of what um, we currently have. Um, I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm in the management department. I um, teach sustainability and business. Um, and run the Master of Sustainable Business, um, just really quickly. But I'm also coordinating OpNet at the moment too, and there's a sign-up sheet here if you want to find out any more information. We all do our own little bit in our own little way, and you know, um, Extinction Rebellion and various things that are happening around Dunedin, 
are really wonderful to see and I think um, both Lisa and I would be applauding that um, as well. So we are all doing um, bits and pieces. So we all also need to you know, um, congratulate ourselves and keep going um, as well. So anyway, that's enough from me. Thank you again, Lisa, um, today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure we all have, and I'm sure this will keep the conversation going, and I hope to see you again at another talk. Thanks very much. So we